Thank you. Um, and I think, you know, one of the commitments we have on this committee is to find those areas where we can move forward together. And um, I think Mr. Khanna really elucidated some of those areas, those bipartisan areas uh, with our industrial base. I think we also have uh, some level of bipartisan consensus on winning the competition with the Chinese Communist Party for those key advanced technologies of the future and countering the CCP's malign influence operations and illegal trade practices. Um, so over the past two years, this administration and Congress have enacted historic pieces of legislation, the Chips and Science and Inflation Reduction Act, which have really led to reshoring of uh, American manufacturing and work to de-risk our critical supply chains with China. So we've seen the U.S. manufacturing sector gain 385,000 jobs in 2021, 396,000 jobs in 2022, largest annual manufacturing gain since 94. And um, we've seen private sector investment in reshoring American manufacturing. I think uh, robust export controls on the Chinese semiconductor industry and working in concert with our key allies, including Japan and the Netherlands, has been very powerful. Um, they're already, these policies are already bearing fruit, but we still need to do more to counter China's threat to the democratic world. Um, I was really glad to see the administration put the Commerce Department at the same table as defense and state. Uh, to support this, I had a provision included in this year's NDAA that will have the DOD further assess where commerce can be brought into our global efforts from the secretary all the way down to attaches abroad, because we really do have to strengthen and expand our investments um, and, and really align all of our forces as a whole of government. Uh, expanding investment into R&D and innovation um, is really, I think, one of the key goals here. But I also am very concerned as we move forward to do all of this um, along the lines of what Rep Steele was talking about. Uh, we really have problems with our rare earth minerals. So last year, as the Biden administration enacted robust export controls on the advanced chips critical to China's domestic semiconductor and AI industries, um, and bringing Japan and Netherlands on board, as we discussed. In response, we saw the CCP announce earlier this month it, it would impose its own export controls on critical minerals such as gallium and germani germanium. Um, so how are these bans impacting our economy, and how is the administration preparing for a potentially larger imposition of sanctions, especially in these rare earth minerals? Um, Ms. Kendler, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. I uh, share your concern about uh, our uh, need for for additional protections to through technology to propose, uh, to support national security. These actions, um, such as the the germanium and gallium controls, are not new for the for the PRC. Um, for for years, especially in the semiconductor industry, they've targeted our technologies. Um, thinking particularly about the Fujian Jinhua uh, theft of intellectual property and, and uh, criminal case associated with that. We've had decades of CCP-directed uh, action, uh, predatory action, really. Um, the, the gallium and germanium controls, they, they, they're just in huge contrast to what we do. They were adopted with ostensibly a national security rationale, but there's been no clarification of what that national security is. In, in huge contrast to what we did with the advanced computing rule last fall, where we were very clear about the military uh, application of the technology that we were controlling. So um, we're working uh, very closely with allies and partners on these issues, and uh, I think it's it's difficult to predict retaliatory action given the, the arbitrary nat nature of China's controls, but we are deeply focused on this. Well, I appreciate that. I I would just push back a little bit. I'm not sure it's that difficult to predict what we're going to see in the future as we continue to try to shape the environment. I think we are going to see um, more and more uh, uh, instances of China putting our supply chains at risk, which is why I do think some area where possibly we could get to bipartisan support is investing in R&D for how we can cleanly mine. 
Um, I, I do think uh, at this point we need to understand how we um, can mine here and in countries that we have good relationships with. I, again, I, I'm happy about the memorandum of understanding with Zambia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo. Um, I do think we have to move more into this area, and I think we have to look here at home as well. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Hinson's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the uh, Biden administration's recent uh, attempts to expand our dialogue and cooperation with the CCP, I think one of the things that I've noticed is there appears to be a lack of accountability. Uh, we've had some very high-profile incidents recently. Our ranking member highlighted a few of those, but I think we can all agree the status quo is too dangerous to leave in place. And the PLA has been more reactive than, reactive than ever. Uh, they've been blatantly and provocatively violating our airspace. Um, they've uh, challenged us in the South China Sea, harassing the U.S. and allied vessels as well. So from a diplomatic standpoint, it really seems like we are uh, sending our representatives there to court China despite these recent provocations without leaving with accountability. Um, having a clear line of communication is important. I think we can all agree that we need to be talking to each other, but it really feels one-sided, and the CCP doesn't seem to be uh, interested in really reducing any of these tensions. Um, so I think really accountability is what we are looking for. We are looking for strength um, and a posture that matches that. Um, so my first question is for Mr. Crittenbrink. Um, would you be able to comment on kind of two elements at play here? Um, did the administration have to make any concessions to get into the room uh, with our diplomatic ventures recently with PRC officials? And um, when clearly the Chinese are not willing to change tactics, uh, why would we continue that strategy if they're not going to meet us at the table? Congresswoman, I can absolutely assure you, we made no concessions to get meetings. That is not how we operate. We went into these meetings with a sense of confidence and strength. We raised these issues very directly. Uh, many of those conversations were tense. We were quite clear about what we are going to continue to do. So I think that kind of communication is important, ma'am, but I would Did also say what's also important, we have to continue to fly, sell, and operate anywhere international law allows, and we will continue to do so. Did the Secretary ask uh, the Chinese uh, authorities about these, these uh, provocations in the South China Sea? Did they ask about the spy balloon? Did they try to hold them accountable for these blatant provocations to the United States? He made absolutely clear how unacceptable these actions are. Again, on the balloon, we, uh, we uh, protested the action, demanded it never happen again, then we shot it down. We also publicized the global nature of the Chinese spy balloon program. And in terms of these provocative uh, actions, perhaps Dr. Ratner wants to respond to them as well, but the Secretary was absolutely crystal clear how unacceptable they are, how dangerous they are. He also indicated, again, we will continue to operate everywhere. That Did he communicate allows. that there will be repercussions if these kinds of actions continue to happen? He communicated that what China is doing is dangerous and irresponsible, and it will not change our operations. Yeah. This is more than just speak softly and carry a big stick. We need to speak loudly and carry a big stick, and I think that's what's missing from these conversations. So I would encourage uh, you to carry that message to uh, the secretaries that uh, we have to, we can be diplomatic and we can have these conversations, but peace through strength means that these bullies need to respect that strength. Um, my next question is for Mrs. Ms. Kendler. Um, one concern I continue to hear about from my constituents and businesses um, is these ag uh, the aggressive and continued uh, attacks on our IP um, and theft there. We know it's been happening. It's been happening for decades, and we've really let um, offenders in China kind of take uh, advantage of our lack of deterrence and consequences for that theft. And um, when they've gone after our tech industry, we've seen it from startups all the way up to our, our larger scale businesses. Uh, I think it's a top of mind concern across across uh, industry and across government. And I know uh, that your work at uh, BIS obviously um, has kind of uh, backed this up as well. And the, the mission is that U.S. security cannot be achieved without the active cooperation of the private sector, which con today controls a greater share of critical U.S. resources than in the past. And um, so I think it's imperative that we do not continue to fail our, our tech industry and our private sector here. But um, I want to talk about Huawei because when we know companies like Huawei who have dozens of subsidiaries and affiliates here in the United States, many of them are operating here, um, I think we need to be very clear-eyed about um, their intentions. So why are we not reciprocating their um, targeted IP theft with targeted repercussions? Um, and I, I would ask you to just elaborate on what you see as the next path and what we can maybe do as a committee to, to really take action there. Well, I draw it in particular uh, on my experience at the Justice Department here and the uh, prosecutions that you see of IP theft, especially IP theft that's, tar that's driven by uh, state-sponsored activity, mm -hmm. sort of economic espionage as opposed to just uh, straight-up IP theft, corporate theft. 
Uh, and I, my, my experience certainly is that the Justice Department is very focused on that effort, and I'd, I'd urge you to uh, speak with them and law enforcement agencies about that. When it comes to tech transfers controlled by the Bureau of Industry and Security, uh, we have a vigorous export control enforcement approach uh, when, when controlled technologies are uh, illicitly acquired by Chinese actors who couldn't get them through lawful means. We are very serious about that approach. And, and um, my, we, I'd be happy to take questions from my export enforcement colleagues uh, to address. If you could follow up with our office with some of the, the steps that you're taking in this space, that would be much appreciated. And again, any recommendations to the committee on steps we can take. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Ms. Stevens. Um, Ms. Kendler, are you aware of export control gaps around open source hardware as it pertains to semiconductors? Has that hit your desk yet, uh, given the recent passage of the chips and science legislation? When you say open source hardware, can, can you help me understand? We're, we're talking you... about CPUs and the design of chips, and particularly, uh, and I know you're focused on export per controls, so this is maybe a little bit more on the importing side. And, and it's okay if this hasn't hit your desk yet, but it has come up in conversation that open source development of chips and particularly what, the, what CCP uh, enterprise is, are producing might uh, propose a national security threat. And if you haven't had a chance to review this yet, we'd love for you to talk to some of the companies on the design side and bring this to the Secretary of Commerce as we move forward with our very exciting implementation of the, the CHIPS legislation, which, as the Commerce Secretary has shared, will give the United States, by the year 2030, the very competitive advantage from soup to nuts of designing, producing, and shipping chips. So we have woken up to the United States great opportunity of being able to produce uh, these complex semiconductors that we that we innovated here. On the electric vehicle front coming from Michigan, we are also aware that the CCP, that, that China, um, became the largest exporter of, of vehicles just this, this year, um, surpassing um, a Germany. And as we're looking to produce and win this next phase of the race, the great moonshot of the 21st century, the proliferation of zero emission vehicles, partly because where the world is moving, right, and where global demand is, can you speak, uh, Ms. Kenler, can you speak to how the Biden administration has been working across departments and agencies to ensure a speedy and safe rollout of electric vehicles? Thank you. I uh, certainly share your concerns about uh, safe rollout of electric vehicles. That's not uh, necessarily something that is run out of BIS, but I'd be happy to take that back uh, and, and get with your team to to work. We, we work know that we know that auto accidents are on the rise, and certainly the here in the United States, and certainly the the, the technology that we're developing, we want to make sure uh, stays. Uh, competitive to our not only our original equipment manufacturers but also to our suppliers and we have so much admiration for the small but mighty role that the BIS plays and just while I still have your time um, and I know you weren't there during the last shutdown but how would a government shutdown impact your your agency and your agency's ability to to do its its work if we did happen to go into a government shutdown Sure, I was not at BIS for the, for the last shutdown, you're right, but um, it, you know, licensing applications will slow down, licensing officers will become less effective, um, less efficient. Um, we need to maintain our high national security standards, so uh, all, all of the work becomes more difficult while we still uh, focus on, on what's required to do our job properly. Does the CR impact you as well? Uh, yes, it would, yes. Yeah, and the same for you, uh, Mr. Crit Rick. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and the same for you, Dr. Ratner. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah so we, we obviously want to have re responsible leadership and recognize that our side of Pennsylvania Avenue also play, plays a, a role in continuing to bolster the United States' competitive advantage as 
we uh, look to our manufacturing prowess, our industrial policy capabilities, our tackling of the trade deficit, and we thank you so much for your time today and your great testimony. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Jimenez is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Secretary Clinton Brink, Brink uh, when's the last time that the PRC asked for a high-level meeting with a senior U.S. government official? Well, uh, Congressman, the engagements that we've had, those have been reached by uh, mutual uh, agreement. Well, I, I asked a pretty specific question. When was the last time that the PRC specifically picked up the phone and asked for a high-level meeting with a high-level U.S. official? Well, I guess the most recent example that, I could, that at least springs to mind immediately, but it didn't come prepared, obviously, to uh, answer formally, but um, uh, the Chinese had indicated uh, over the last month that they very much wanted to uh, accept Secretary Blinken's uh, uh, offer for the Chinese State Council and Foreign Minister to visit Washington, D.C. But that, that was based on, on a request from us? It was based on an invitation. But so they so we asked out. them to come over, and then they said they would? We indicated that we would be open to that, and they indicated that So they that's not the question. The question is, when was the last time that the PRC initiated a request to meet with a high-level U.S. official? I would say that's the most recent. They requested a meeting for the Chinese Foreign Minister. After, after we invited them. After we invited them. Well, sure. but. I think we'd go without saying um, they probably wouldn't ask if they didn't know we were ready for them. We 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 issued an invitation. It was up to them to tell us whether that, they wanted to accept or come, and they came, or they they indicated they would like to. Secretary, that's not you know. I'm I'm asking a different kind of question. You're giving me a different kind of answer. So, to me, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we continue to be asking for all these high level meetings with uh, high level officials in China. We continue to do that. Please meet us, please, you know, can we go over there and all. Doesn't it seem to you like that may be looked at around the world as a sign of weakness that we are the junior partner? Respectfully, sir, I completely disagree. We think. Fair enough, you disagree, we, yeah, we, that's fine. That's we fine. think a disagree. responsible I own, country I only have engage. two minutes and Sorry. 40 seconds, so I'm, I, I'll accept your answer. Um, Secretary um, Kender, uh, you said that you wanted to maintain uh, trade um, that would not undermine national security. I pose to you that just about every, everything we do with the Chinese undermines national security, as long as we maintain a trade deficit. Because every dollar that we send to China is going to be used to undermine American interests. Do you disagree with that? Respectfully, sir, I do disagree with that. Okay. There, there is, um, in my view, a, a great deal of room for commercial trade that does not harm national security. But if, if in fact, the trade, remember what I said about trade deficit, all right? So we are at a trade deficit. As long as China continues to make money off the United States, that money is going to be used to undermine the interests of the United States around the world. Do you disagree with that? I. I I would agree that the Chinese government, the CCP, uh, uses funds to support its industry in, in, in a way that uh, advances its interests, yes. Okay, and so, in a sense, as we continue this trade imbalance, the money that we're sending over to the CCP is actually being used against us in a variety of different ways. Uh, and so, I actually, you know, I agree with my, with my colleague from across the aisle, you know, um, uh, Congressman uh, Khanna, that we have, we need to reestablish our national security industrial base. What can the Commerce Department do to reestablish that base? And a lot has been talk about chips. Frankly, chips are useless unless there's in something, okay? A chip can't do anything unless it's in a car or it's in a boat or it's in a missile system, uh, it's in a tank. But if we don't produce those things, the chips are useless. So what can we do to reestablish that national security industrial base that we have lost over the years? And I'll give you an example, and I, I mean, I may have gone, no, I've still got 20 seconds. We won World War II because, especially in the Pacific, because for every one aircraft carrier that the, the Japanese built, we built six. 
we don't have that capability anymore. How can we restore that capability back to the United States? The Commerce Department has a lot of endeavors in this space. Obviously, you mentioned the, the CHIPS focus, um, but we are working across the country to build up uh, our, our industrial base. The um, point that I'd make is that through international trade, our, and what I hear from our industry is that they are able to innovate and to make groundbreaking discoveries in support of our national security because of the international trade that they engage in. The time has expired. Mr. Auchincloss. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's clear bipartisan consensus on this committee that we need to be in a position of strength relative to the Chinese Communist Party. Their, uh, Xi Jinping and, and his Politburo recognize strength above all else, but there's a, a concerning false equivalence that I'm hearing between diplomacy and, and weakness, and it's, um, it misunderstands the nature of when to engage with an adversary. Uh, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Yellen are landing in Beijing in a position of strength, and that is why it's time to talk. Uh, Dr. Ratner, would you say that over the last two years, because of our actions in arming Taiwan, because of our agreement with AUKUS, because of our freedom of navigation maneuvers in the South China Sea, because of Force Redesign 2030, uh, led by the Marine Corps, that we are militarily stronger in the Indo-Pacific than we were? Absolutely, Congressman. And would you say that because President Biden has rallied NATO to support and defend Ukraine, fighting on the front lines of the free world against Vladimir Putin, that we are stronger in the Indo-Pacific as well as in Europe? Yes, I think our actions in Europe have strengthened deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. And do you think Xi Jinping is watching what happens in Ukraine? I think he's watching very closely. And what would happen if under a different administration we were to cut and run from Ukraine? Congressman, I don't want to speculate, but just to reiterate the point, I do think our support for Ukraine and our ability to rally the international community has strengthened deterrence in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And Mr. Crittenberg, do you think that we are stronger relative to where we were two years ago in terms of our multilateral and bilateral alliances in the Indo-Pacific because of IPEF, because of our engagement with Singapore and the Philippines and Guam? Absolutely, without a doubt. And how important is the Japanese-Korean rapprochement that we have seen over the last two years? Exceptionally important. I would argue that our individual alliances with Japan and Korea are stronger than they've ever been before. The fact that they have achieved this extraordinary rapprochement has led to an unprecedented strengthening of our trilateral relationship as well, which makes us all safer. Uh, and I would note also that over the last two years, with real wages rising, with uh, more than 13 million jobs created, with investments in infrastructure and industry, uh, our economy uh, is in relatively stronger shape relative to China, which is facing high youth unemployment and a huge debt crisis right now. Um, the time to talk is when we have su significant strength, and thanks to President Biden leadership, we, we do. Um, I'm also hearing a, a real mischaracterization of trade as zero sum. It's a common trope that somehow Trade and the trade deficit uh, implies weakness. I mean, I, I have a trade deficit with my grocery store. That, that, that doesn't mean that I'm weaker relative to star market. Um, Ms. Kendler, uh, does trade between the United States and large markets, does that lower costs for American consumers by driving down the cost of imports? Yes, it does. And would revoking trade with a large market like China, would that functionally be a sales tax that would disproportionately impact low-income Americans? It could be characterized that way, yes. Does access to the Chinese market allow U.S. industry to have standard setting and other soft power prerogatives? It, it does. We're very engaged on standards activity. Can it help prevent Chinese dominance of large internal markets in a way that would give them that standard setting and soft power? We are very focused on that issue. Yes. Does it give America incorporated scale economies, especially for high fixed costs, low marginal cost industries like biopharmaceuticals or semiconductors or telecoms, so that we can invest more in R&D here? Yes, that's the innovation point that I was making earlier, yes. That's good to hear. Now, despite these benefits, do we have to be uh, rigorous and disciplined in ensuring that we don't transfer dual-use technologies to the Chinese? Absolutely. We're critically focused on protecting our national security and dual-use tech transfers. And just for the record, you do care about doing that? <laughs> Deeply, sir. That's good. Uh, it's all well and good to try to impair the transfer of dual-use technologies, but that just buys us time. Ultimately, we're going to have to outcompete and out innovate the Chinese economy. I was very heartened to see that in, in the Republicans' uh, China Task Force report from last Congress, uh, it recommended a doubling of basic R&D funding. Bravo, I agree. 
I have been disheartened to see, though, in these appropriations bills coming from the, 20, the 118th Congress that the GOP-led Appropriations Committee is cutting funding for science. Uh, Dr. Ratner is underinvesting in basic research, ultimately going to impair technology and its applications to military might. Congressman, we certainly support uh, strong uh, research dollars, and the, and the uh, department's budget request has the largest request for uh, research and development ever. Yeah, if we cut science, we will not win. I yield back. Mr. Molinar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all of you today. Uh, Dr. Ratner, I'd like to start with you. Uh, as someone serving in the highest levels of the Defense Department, uh, you are well aware of the military civil fusion the CCP uses to blur the lines between business and the military, rendering effectively uh, you know, no difference between the military and business in China. Do you think it makes sense for states to allow companies that pledge allegiance to the CCP to build facilities in the United States? Congressman, I think what is important here is that our economic exchange, our technolog technological exchange from the perspective of the Department of Defense does not support or advance the capabilities of the PLA. Okay. The uh, Michigan National Guard has hosted military representatives from Taiwan for training at Camp Grayling in my home state. Would you agree that any location where we are training Taiwan's military should be considered a sensitive site? Congressman, I'd, I'd prefer to discuss topics of uh, military engagement with Taiwan in a classified setting. I understand if we were talking, you know, strategy or something, but I mean, this is uh, in the public do domain that we are training Taiwanese uh, at Camp Grayling, and I'm just asking if you would consider that a sensitive site. Uh, by sensitive site, as a technical matter, I'm not familiar with that term. Well, something that you would want to prevent the CCP from learning more about. Congressman, as I said, I think these matters are best discussed in a, in a classified setting. I don't think it advantages us to expose uh, our military uh, cooperation and support with Taiwan. Okay. So I'm going to take that to say yes, that you do believe that would be a sensitive site. Um, Knowing that the CCP will leverage every asset it can, how many miles would you be, how many miles away would you be comfortable with a CCP affiliated company building a factory near a sensitive site? Would it be 10 miles, 20 miles, 200 miles? Uh, Congressman, I know that the department looks very carefully at the security, physical security, and information security of its facilities. I don't have a direct uh, numerical value for you, but of course that's something we should take seriously. Okay. Uh, I, I say this because there was a situation in North Dakota, as I'm sure you're very well aware, where CFIUS, you know, declined to be involved and, uh, you know, the military had to step in and say, no, this is not acceptable. Are you familiar with that situation? Uh, I am, Congressman. Okay. Um, well, just in general, do you think it makes sense for Michigan to welcome Taiwan's military for training in our state? and then turn around and invite CCP-affiliated companies to build manufacture, manufacturing facilities in our state. Congressman, I fully understand the, the point you're making. Uh, I agree with it in principle, and I think it's important that, uh, as it relates to our uh, unilateral military activities, our activities with all of our allies and partners, that we should be careful uh, because the, the PRC is going through several means, physical, espionage, cyber attacks to try to undermine and intervene in those relationships uh, in the United States and around the world, and that's something we ought to be vigilant against. Okay, thank you. And I will take you up on the idea of getting together and talking about this uh, in a different setting. Um, are you concerned about the delay in delivering weapons to Taiwan? Congressman, I think this, there is a uh, misunderstanding uh, as it relates to U.S. support for Taiwan in terms of our foreign military sales. Um, what we are facing is not a backlog, as is sometimes described, but rather uh, concerns and slowdowns within all of our industrial base that is affecting uh, our military production and our defense industrial base systematically, uh, not individually as it relates to Taiwan. And we're doing everything we can to fulfill our commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act 
as quickly as we can uh, through foreign military sales, but also through other authorities, including presidential drawdown authority uh, and potentially foreign military financing. And I would just encourage uh, members of this committee and the U.S. Congress, as Secretary Austin has said, to put, appropriations, to put appropriations against the authorities that Congress itself has granted the department. And that would go a long way in expediting capability for Taiwan far faster, far sooner, and with more significant value than would adjustments to the pace of our foreign military sales. Okay, thank you. And just with a few seconds left, uh, Secretary Candler, uh, would you consider the United States to be the leader in battery technology for automotive applications? I'm going to have to take that for the record. I think I am not. Yes, yes or no, real quick. Is your time? I, is I, I'm, I'm sorry. I think okay. so. Yes. Time has expired. Mr. Torres. Thank you. Um, you know, I had prepared questions, but I actually might want to follow up on the colloquy that Undersecretary Clinton Brink had with the chairman. Uh, the chairman asked you exactly how are the actions of the administration unprecedented, and I might want to take a crack at answering that question. It seems to me that the unprecedented nature of the administration's actions should be seen not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. It should be seen holistically. And when you consider the historic export controls on advanced semiconductors, which are the most critical of critical technologies, which will have implications far beyond semiconductors, implications for AI and quantum computing and just about every form of emerging technology, when you consider the historic security alliance between the United States and Australia, in which we're equipping Australia with nuclear submarines, when you consider the expansion of military bases in the Philippines and the rapprochement between Japan and South Korea and the historic remilitarization of Japan, a development not seen since World War II, Japan's defense budget has gone from 1% to 2%. It seems to me the sum total of all of those actions especially in the backyard of China, would seem to exceed anything that any administration has previously done to deter China. And China does not perceive these actions as weakness. It perceives these actions as containment. So is that a fair description of the unprecedented approach that the administration has taken? Congressman, I agree with you 100 percent. And I also want to examine the notion that diplomacy as practiced by the Biden administration is a form of weakness. It seems to me there ought to be a communicative relationship between the two leading superpowers in the world. Even during the peak of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a channel of crisis communication between the United States and the Soviet Union. You know, my concern is that a lack of communication could mean that we're one incident away, one miscalculation away, from a catastrophic outbreak of war. So is that a fair assessment of the need for diplomacy between the two leading superpowers in the world? Absolutely. We believe that we're strong, we're confident, we're also responsible. And that's why we're pursuing those communication channels. And I want to examine the notion that the delay in the controls, the investment controls, is also somehow a function of weakness. Um, you, you know, it, it, it seems to me that, you know, Getting these controls right is not an exact science. I mean, we have to figure out how do we limit China's competitiveness without undermining our own competitiveness, right? We want to impose controls on China but not provoke a response that's so retaliatory that it does us more harm than good. So that, to me, is not about weakness. That's about figuring out the right balancing act. Is that a fair description of what's happening within the administration? What I would say, Congressman, is we, we believe we, we have to be strong, we have to be robust. We also have to be very smart and very strategic and to make sure that we understand uh, precisely the impact of our actions and make sure that they land with maximum effect. You know, if, I feel like we often use buzzwords to describe our approach to China. Strategic decoupling, de-risking, and I wonder, have we gone beyond the buzzwords? Do, do we have an actual plan for de-risking the relationship with China? Do we have an actual timeline for de-risking? Because we are dangerously dependent on China for critical minerals, rare earth elements, clean energy technologies, active pharmaceutical ingredients. Do we have plans for and timelines for de-risking in each of these areas? Maybe I'll take an initial stab at that, Congressman. I, I can't say that I have a specific timeline by which we will reach X goal, but absolutely de-risking is our strategy. And, and to the previous comment, 
there are uh, obviously challenges in our But, but shouldn't we have, uh, it seems to me, we, we need actual plans that make de-risking a reality. We're, we're and we need timelines by which we hold ourselves accountable. We're absolutely pursuing de-risking. We've, we've argued here right. there are benefits to trade. There are more than 700,000 American jobs that depend on exports to China. What we can't continue, though, is um, uh, uh, vulnerabilities in our supply chains uh, that make us and our partners uh, vulnerable to either disruption or for our partners' coercion. And we are very aggressively And, and I noticed there's been a shift in language from strategic decoupling to de-risking. Um, is there a difference between the two? What's the difference between the two? Well, the argument is somehow decoupling or ceasing all no, trade. Not all trade, strategic yeah. decoupling and de-risking. Uh, That's a nice sleight of hand, but no. All, all, all I can say is uh, our, our policy is to pursue de-risking, which is, again, to Is there a difference between the two, yes or no? Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'll have to take that back and come back to you, Congressman. Right. I'd like a response on that, too. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us. Mr. Ratner, the Biden administration talks about the pursuit of guardrails in the USPRC relationship. And as I know you're aware, uh, in this last year, it represented a historic high in PLA incursions in Taiwanese air defense identification zone. We also know, too, that the PLL Navy is engaged in the largest naval peacetime buildup in the history of the world. We also know, too, that despite years of trying, the PLA has so far refused to establish a crisis communication channel with the United States military. Can you tell me within that realm how then this policy of guardrails has resulted in fewer incursions in the air defense identification zone, as in any way, shape, or form, influenced the massive military buildup, including ships for the PLL Navy. Can you tell me how it's encouraged in any way, shape, or form the Chinese to open a crisis communication channel so we don't have this, this miscalculation that you all talk about? There's nothing that's happened that avoids that miscalculation. Can you tell me how the guardrails are functioning, uh, how they're going to get us to a place where all these things are de-escalating to a point where we can feel like we're making some progress. Congressman, the, the principal response of the Department of Defense to the trends you're describing is to reinforce our own combat credible deterrence in terms of our own capability and alongside our allies and partners. So that's how we're responding uh, to China's military modernization. The notion of guardrails and the notion of military to military communications is intended to do a few things. One, to during periods of crisis establish those kinds of communications. Two, to be able to inject strategic messages uh, when necessary. Um, but they are not uh, the, the singular or primary response to PLA military modernization. Seems like to me, though, there's contradictory statements, though, coming out where you say that the effort is to deter. We want to deter the Chinese from, from these sorts of actions. Yet we see that there's no deterrence there. We see them continuing massive buildups. We see increase in, in very aggressive behavior in those areas. We talk about wanting to avoid miscalculation, yet we do nothing to really force the issue on crisis communications. And, and, and then on the, on the other side, we say that, well, we're, we're, we're going to go out there and, and do this constructive engagement uh, that results in nothing other than our military having to continue massive amounts of buildup ourselves, uh, and, and that, too, is, we're told, as a policy that's going to deter the Chinese. Can you, can you reconcile how you look at both of those and say that none of this is having an effect on the PLA? Congressman, when we talk about uh, deterrence, we're talking about combat-credible deterrence, right. and our, our central goal is to uh, prevent the PRC from initiating aggression against the United States and our allies and partners and being prepared to prevail if they miscalculate and make that decision. The actions you're describing are acts of coercion, gray zone activity is described. We do focus on that insofar as we are working to uh, conduct our own operations to ensure we remain, retain the ability to operate consistent with international law and we are enabling our allies and partners, including Taiwan, to be more resilient and to be able to respond to that kind of behavior. 
But in that realm, we don't even look at it. It's great to have mill-to-mill -mill build up and talk about what are we going to do in that deterrent realm, but there hasn't even been an assertion of a conversation about where China's going. By, by, by 2030, they'll have 1,500 nuclear weapons, 1,500. And somehow we think that you know, our, our strategic deterrence in the conventional realm is the only place that we need to be and that we aren't even having conversations about how somehow we limit the military buildup, not just on conventional, but on, on the nuclear side. So tell me, what, what's the policy for us besides the deterrence from us building up a military to say somehow we want to get to a point where each side stops building up, that there has to be a point where you say, Maybe we ought to have a conversation about where this, where the stopping point is. You know, even with Russia, we had that. Congressman, I think what you're describing is that there are, uh, and that is one of the reasons why we are interested in talking with the PLA, particularly as it relates to new domains like space and cyber, to understand the escalatory potential there, uh, and so we can both shape our uh, actions and policies accordingly. Um, as it relates to nuclear weapons, I will just say the President's budget seeks more than $37 billion for modernization of the nuclear triad. We are taking China's nuclear modernization uh, seriously. Time has expired. Ms. Castor. Well, thank you to the witnesses for your testimony and your service to America. The costs and harms of the climate crisis have never been more apparent to uh, Americans and people all across the globe. Uh, Secretary Ratner, yesterday the Joint Economic Committee highlighted climate risks to the U.S. military, U.S. military bases and other DOD assets. They say it's a fundamental threat to our national security. This followed a 2018 DOD assessment of climate uh, threats to our strategic infrastructure, a 2019 DOD report as well on climate impacts. They noted repeated flooding at Naval Base Guam as already limiting operations and activities for the Navy Expeditionary Forces Command Pacific and the island's Anderson Air Force Base, submarine squadrons, telecommunications, and a number of other specific tasks supporting mission execution. Uh, considering the U.S. has more than 200 bases in the Indo-PACOM area of operation, and there have been 411 natural disasters, a typhoon which left most of Guam without power, uh, Anderson Air Force Base, Marine Corps Camp Blas with more than two feet of rain. What, uh, how do these climate fuel disasters affect our uh, Indo-Pacific military strategy? What's, what is DOD doing to ensure installation, resilience, and readiness, and personnel safety in that region? Congresswoman, I can provide you with a, a specific answer to that question following the hearing. I will say uh, this is clearly a major issue for the department. You have cited many of the reasons why that is. It affects our facilities. Uh, it potentially affects our ability to operate uh, in the event of severe weather, and it has destabilizing effects potentially on the, in the region, including for some of our closest allies and partners. So this is uh, an important issue for the department, and happy and the, to provide do the, you with Do the budget cuts uh, to climate resilience and programs at DOD hurt our posture? Congresswoman, again, I'll get you the specifics following the hearing, but uh, absolutely it's important that we continue to invest in, in uh, resilience, and we've seen some of the effects of this severe weather uh, recently, as you described. Uh, Secretary uh, Krinkenbrink, the Biden administration focus on strengthening relationships with allies and partners to counter the Chinese Communist Party has been very important. This includes climate resilience and clean energy. Can you talk about the importance of USAID, uh, the Development Finance Corporation, and the Southeast Asia Smart Power Program, Clean Edge Asia, uh, to our national security and our interest in countering China? Yes, Congresswoman, thank you very much. I would argue that um, uh, I would fully agree strengthening our relationship with allies and partners is central to our entire strategy, our security and prosperity in the region, and our ability to outcompete China, certainly for friends in Southeast Asia and perhaps even more so in the Pacific Islands. Climate resilience is an existential national security question. So our work together in building resilience on these transnational uh, challenges is incredibly important. The work that USAID, DFC, and, and others do uh, in the energy uh, realm, 
uh, in promoting clean energy, climate adaptation, and resilience is really central to what we're trying to achieve. When you say central, you mean it's critical to the entire de-risking strategy, what you just talked about with Congressman Torres? I would say yes, ma'am, and, and certainly in Southeast Asia, I would argue it's even more urgent uh, among our Pacific Island partners. We talk about meeting them where they live. Our strategy is designed to cooperate with them on the issues that are most urgent for them. I think climate would probably be number one for almost all of them. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Barr. Thank you. With all respect, I think um, one of the reasons why our adversary might view us as weak is that chasing detente and focusing on the weather is not really negotiating from a position of strength. Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink, on the anniversary of Tiananmen, June 4th, you boarded a plane to travel to Beijing to engage in diplomatic talks just miles from where the massacre occurred. That very same day, the Department of State issued what is arguably the weakest statement ever by the U.S. government honoring the memory of Tiananmen. Can you explain why the department would choose those days above all to engage with the CCP? Congressman, I want to be uh, absolutely clear. I agreed to travel to Beijing for meetings with my counterpart on June 5. The only way I could get to Beijing by that date was to leave here on June 2nd, which caused me to arrive uh, in Beijing on June 4 where I held internal meetings in the embassy, in the U.S. Embassy, um, to prepare with my counterparts for my meetings on June 5. Simultaneous to that, uh, the Secretary of State, other State Department officials uh, issued uh, a very tough statement, as we always do annually, on the Tiananmen Massacre of Innocent Civilians, the 34th anniversary of that. Why, why, was, it th why was it weaker than, than previous statements from I, the State Department I, years before? Congress administration. I can't, uh, I, I can't agree with that do you, statement. Do you, do you agree that it was a watered-down statement? I, I absolutely do not. Uh, we why, why was it different than previous years? I, I can't respond to, and I don't have it in front of me exactly how it, it was different. It was different, but what I can assure It was. Do you agree? It was a different, different uh, kind of statement? I, I, I don't agree with that, sir. I agree that on the 34th anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre, the Secretary spoke out, as he always does, and more, perhaps more importantly, while I was in Beijing, and uh, even more importantly, while Secretary Blinken was in Beijing, we raised these very issues, and we raised them forcefully uh, with the Chinese. The Chinese have, there's, there's no uh, ambiguity uh, in the Chinese mind about our views on the Tiananmen. So there, there's, a, there's commentary from a Foreign Policy magazine that says, um, approach an adversary from a position of palpable neediness. Make upfront concessions to gain goodwill and settle for uncertain political deliverable that lies in the future. This characterizes the Biden policy on China. Assistant Secretary Crittenbrink, following up my questioning from earlier this week in the Foreign Affairs Committee, have you or anyone at the State Department encouraged another agency to delay implementation of a sanction or export control, yes or no? Congressman, I cannot accept the characterization of our policy. We approach our policy with China. That was not my characterization. That was commentary from Foreign and Policy I, and Magazine. I categorically reject that. Have you or anyone at the State Department encouraged another agency to delay implementation of a sanction or export control? Congressman, I'm not going to get into the deliberations of, of pre decision that, that is a very important question. And I that, that speaks to the policy of this administration on China. Yes, sir. Have you or anyone at the State Department encouraged another agency to delay implementation of a sanction or export control related to China? What we have done, Congressman, is carried out an unprecedented number of actions. I don't think you're answering China. the question. And that is a question that this administration needs to answer for the American people because we've seen a spy balloon traverse our sensitive military sites. We have seen a spy station set up 90 miles from the continental United States. We have seen a, a, a policy of chasing diplomacy without any strength. We see no deterrence on Taiwan. The American people need security. We need strength. 
We do not need weakness. Did you or others at state, including Wendy Sherman or Rick Waters, ever advocate or consult with NSC or other agencies to delay an action like entity listing? Congressman, again, I'm not going to address uh, pre-deliberative uh, matters uh, under consideration. What I will underscore, what has this administration done? We have carried out an unprecedented number of strong actions, both in terms of sanctions, entity listings, visa restrictions, strengthening of our relationships with allies and partners, strengthening our military deterrent capability and those of our allies and partners. We are proud of what we've achieved we, we in got our China uh, process, Let the record show the gentleman was asking about past deliberations, um, and the witness has refused to answer. Uh, Mr. LaHood is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you may know, this committee was established back in January with broad bipartisan support to create the Select Committee on China. And I would argue there's no more important issue or strategic priority for uh, the Congress or the administration than our approach to China. And what is very frustrating about today is why we don't have uh, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin, and Secretary Raimondo. We have tried to work over the last two months to get them here, and with such a priority and bipartisan support, it's perplexing and frustrating that they're not here today. And with all due respect to you and your testimony here today, they should be here, and they're not. And, and by the way, th 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 as you look at the other priorities that the Biden administration had, we, there was no problem whether it was the CHIPS Act or the IRA or other priorities to have them here and testify and go through it. So it, it borders on unacceptable that they're not here. I, I want to focus um, particularly on China's rising influence in many of the world's multinational institutions and organizations, particularly the United Nations the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the World Health Organization. And I want to share a few statements and examples that highlight this concern. The first is an op-ed written by D.J. Norquist, former U.S. Executive Director of the World Bank from 2019 to 2021, in an article titled, quote, China is using the World Bank as its piggy bank, unquote. In that article, um, Ms. Norquist cites a recent GAO study showing that Chinese state-owned enterprises, SOEs, secure nearly 30% of World Bank funds used for procurement for economic development projects compared to less than 1% procurement for U.S. firms. In the op-ed, Ms. Norquist writes, quote, why would China be willing to underbid and lose money on projects, question mark. It is playing a long game. Building capacity and relationships through these contracts to further enmesh itself in the economies of developing countries. It is using the World Bank to create new client states, uh, contemplating the work of its uh, Belt and Road Initiative to sink tentacles into countries with no questions asked loans. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to submit this article from the Wall Street Journal as well as the GAO study she cites into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Additionally, in 2021, Secretary Blinken raised serious concerns over China's influence in the World Health Organization report on COVID-19 origins, stating, quote, we've got real concerns about the methodology and process that went into that report, including the fact that the government in Beijing apparently helped write it, unquote. And finally, we have seen this continue to become a real problem at the United Nations and elsewhere. China uses financial contributions and increased employment of Chinese nationals within these organizations to strong arm developing countries and advance CCP priorities. The question is really open to all of you, but I'll start with Mr. Uh, Crittenbrink. Uh, let, me, let, let me ask you, um, can you give a specific um, uh, initiatives and, and what the Biden administration is doing about China's rising influence in these global organizations. And maybe if you could respond to the, what the, the comments I made regarding the World Bank and whether th there are currently diplomatic uh, initiatives or priorities that the administration is engaged in. Thank you, Congressman. I would say, first of all, on international organizations, the best way to respond to that challenge is to make sure that we're very active in running our own candidates and in supporting like-minded candidates who share our values for how... Um, and is the administration doing that? 
We absolutely are. And, we're and give me some examples. Steps. What are you doing specifically? Uh, I can bring back to you uh, a couple uh, of examples, but certainly uh, I believe as the head of the International Organization of Migration, uh, we've run a successful campaign for the U.S. candidate, for the U.S. candidate, but we've run a, a number of these campaigns over the last Besides few years. Besides that example, can you cite others specifically here today on what you're doing? Um, I, I will come back. I'd be happy to come back to you on that, sir. But, but this any... is an absolute priority, and, and we recognize the challenge that you've outlined. That's why we've uh, approached it so aggressively, again, in running our own candidates and supporting other like-minded candidates. Can anybody else cite any examples? Yes, Congressman. Ian Saunders from the Commerce Department was recently, uh, he's, he's recently made the new head of the World Customs Organization. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, questioning time has uh, ended. I'm Shocked that we made it with votes having been called. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I do want to foot stomp what Mr. LaHood said, uh, that we appreciate your presence and your testimony and the exchange of ideas, um, uh, tense though it may be at times. Uh, we, we fully expect that your your bosses will, will join the committee before the year's end. We hope you bring that message back to them. Um, and I want to remind members that questions for the record are due one week from today on July 27th. Without objection, the committee hearing is adjourned.